Mirror's Edge Catalyst is a 2016 video game developed by DICE and published by EA. Sequel to the original parkour cult hit of 2008, Mirror's Edge, which asked the age-old question, can Asian women climb things? The answer? Sometimes. Catalyst is one of those games I thought would ever be left in the dusty wastes of my desktop. One, because back when I bought it, you could only get it on Origin, and having to use Origin to play PC games in 2022 feels like asking my dementia-ridden grandmother if I'm allowed to go out to play. And two, because I had already attempted to play said game twice, and both times lost interest after about an hour and a half. Now, going back to something that hasn't worked out two times in a row is usually an indication it won't turn out any better on the third go. Like, you've tried making things work with Samantha twice already, maybe you should come to accept the fact that maybe the third time isn't going to change the fact that she wants kids and you want an eight foot tall body pillow of the big lady from Resident Evil 8. But in the case of Catalyst, third time was the charm. I've loosened up to the idea of having tiny little Jenkins running about, and you know what? Samantha's gonna buy herself a wee Ouroboros body pillow herself. Because as it turns out, after you get past the first few stagnant opening missions of Mirror's Edge Catalyst, a game that has upgrades tied to essential pieces of movement in a game, get this, all about movement, there is a fantastically funky fresh New Age Delivery Worker video game right in here. Mirror's Edge Catalyst's biggest problem is that it is a great game buried underneath a slow opening. Slow both in terms of plot and mechanics. Well, kind of. On a repeat playthrough, I realised it's a bit more complicated than that. The opening mission itself is great. There's not two and a bit minutes goes by before you're not already running and jumping away from the cyber fuzz, but the subsequent main missions feel like filler for about 30 to 45 minutes. You meet with a guy called Birdman, no, not Michael Keaton, unfortunately, who has you do a tutorial for the optional dash time trials for some reason, then you faff about a little bit more with him, doing fairly meaningless stuff, before you get to do your first big run and start the story properly, really where it should have all began in the first place. Probably the most egregious opening decision that will put players off of Mirror's Edge Catalyst is that essential movement techniques are locked behind an upgrade system. And no, not super advanced free running techniques like untangling earphones in a full sprint or kicking James Bond off of a crane. You have to unlock the ability to roll safely out of a fall. Yeah, in a game where you play as a woman whose job it is to professionally run and jump off of buildings since at least 2008, you have to unlock the ability for her not to break her legs every time she lands from a jump higher than about 8 feet. And spoilers, unlike Hobbiton, all the buildings in this game are at least 8 feet tall. Surely that's kind of fundamental. That's like hearing, congratulations, you have now unlocked the ability to exhale as well as inhale. You'd be like, <sighs> oh, Fucking hell. Rolling out of a high fall, tucking your legs mid-jump, and being able to chain two wall runs together are some of the abilities you need to manually unlock in Catalyst that Faith was able to do from the very beginning of the 2008 original. Strangely, as well, these abilities can be unlocked fairly quickly. I think I got the ability to roll out of a fall within about 35 minutes of starting the game, so it just begs the question, why is there even an unlock system in the first place? It's like showing up to a foot race where you're not allowed shoes, and then like 35 minutes in the guy goes, <laughs> by the way, <laughs> here's a pair of shoes, I was just fucking with you. Now as well as nerfing the already underrepresented worker that is the extreme sports delivery person, it also somewhat robs the experienced player the satisfaction of great success after mastering the game's mechanics. There's a lot to be said for the intrinsic satisfaction of games like Skate or Trials, where the first playthrough is 85% scraping your nose off of the scenery, only to replay it many hours later with the confidence and prowess of those Japanese Charlie's Angels who make mochi with country fair wooden mallets. And while that still is in the game, in Catalyst both a pro and newbie are hamstrung to the exact same level of movement regardless of skill. But I did say things were complicated. So on my second playthrough, I did to grab footage, 
I realised I was having notably more fun and was getting through things a lot quicker. And I realised it's because I actually knew where to go now. When you first start Catalyst, you'll probably want to explore the brand new for this game, Open World. But there's two problems with that. One, the open world isn't particularly interesting because even though there's little glyphs to collect, there's not a lot of character or environmental storytelling you're going to get from running around this city-sized Apple store. And two, it is so fucking easy to get lost. There are countless instances of objectives or safe houses I needed to reach which resulted in me circling a building endlessly like I was looking for an open drive through window. One of the aforementioned starter missions, which feels like tutorial fluff, has you fist this antenna that explodes and then you run away from the Google police. Now, to get the fuzz off your back, you need to duck into a safe house, but the nearest one has such an awkward entrance that I spent a full 10 minutes just dying again and again trying to find it, even on my second playthrough. But on a second playthrough, you mostly don't worry about that. You will still get lost because the majority of the game looks like you're running around an architectural diorama, but once you know that the Metagrid climbing towers and the carefully crafted main missions are easily the most fun part of the game, you'll just beeline it to them as best as you can. It makes me wonder if having some sort of smaller hub area, like the original Tomb Raider, with more character and less awkward furniture to get lost on would improve the game, but admittedly, some areas of the world are a lot more well designed than others, so it feels like something you mostly just have to fight your way through until you get to the better part of the game. In saying that though, once you know your way around and Faith gets to spend her magical pedometer points on the old Mario art of running and jumping, not only does Mirror's Edge Catalyst become a pretty gosh darn fun video game, I dare say it's even more fun than the original. I don't know why I'm saying like, dare I say? Like it, like it was like it was a hard decision? No, like, when I had to get footage for Mirror's Edge 1, I felt like I was playing as a disabled person who just fell down some stairs. Mirror's Edge Catalyst, when I had to play it again for footage, ended up just playing it again. Great fun, great game. Great game. Play it. It's good fun. It's cheap as fuck. Catalyst's sense of speed is so much more effective than the original that going from a fully upgraded Faith in Catalyst back to the first level of the 2008 original feels like playing as someone who just stood up for the first time in five years after appearing on TLC's My £600 Life. That's mostly due to one small but essential improvement to the movement, the shift button. Not, not the shift key on the keyboard. By the way, I'd unplug my keyboard, but you know what a keyboard looks like. Not the shift key on the keyboard, it's just called like the shift mechanic. Don't know why, it should, it should have called it something else, it's too confusing, it's mapped to right click. It's dumb, it's confusing, that's why this game failed. Hire me EA, hire me DICE, alright, I'll fix your shit. You know why no one bought Catalyst? Because everyone's racist, okay? Make Faith a bald white guy. I'm available. The shift button acts as a small burst of acceleration to whip Faith into the direction you want and it is essential to the video game good times. In the original, you have to let Faith slowly build up momentum so presumably she doesn't rupture any of those disgusting varicose veins she got from her tenure at TLC, but in Catalyst, you can actually move Faith like a person. Starting from a dead stop no longer feels like getting granny through airport security. You just hit the shift button and she blasts full sprint in whatever direction you want apart from directly up, because disappointingly, Faith is not a helicopter. The game also has, in general, more thoughtful level design and removes the sluggish parts of the original. Crappy gunplay, a gone. Slow down time feature that looks kind of cool but is practically speaking useless, not here. Slow tightrope walking on pipes, actually in the game, but much improved as it's quicker and is mainly used to mount swing bars and move up from there. It's, it's actually really good fun. And then there's the Batman gadgets. Very much like a Metroidvania, Faith eventually obtains the Grapple, a device that fiction has led me to believe is far more viable than the crushing disappointment of reality would have you know. It allows you to zipline to or swing from predetermined points throughout the map, and while you don't get to use it quite as often as I'd like, when you finally get to leap through the air and glide over four lanes of traffic, it feels like you get to experience the gentle gift of flight as a brief reward for all your manic cardio. Like I mentioned earlier, unlike the original, which is a completely linear game, Catalyst is open world with carefully crafted linear story missions. So if Mirror's Edge 1 is like Burnout 3, Catalyst is Forza Horizon. This new open world direction means that if you turn off the game's guidance system, 
that is Runner Vision, the game develops what I call PS2 era game design. That is, you spend most of your time shouting at the TV, where the fuck do I go? Full Runner Vision is too much and feels like you're one step away from the game designer doing the level for you, and no Runner Vision at all is nearly completely useless with how homogenous the game world looks. Abstract glass skyscrapers tend to bleed into one another after a while. Apart from dirty shoe marks on the walls you climb up, there is no, what would you call it, seamless pathfinding. Like Uncharted's trademark yellow and God of War's also trademark yellow. Sony has a thing for yellow, I don't know why either. Point is, setting runner vision to classic is usually enough guidance so you can maintain a satisfying flow without feeling like the game designer is going to personally punch you in the throat for not following their instructions. And then there's the combat. You know, I can't remember the last time I experienced a game mechanic that was so close to being great. A lot like every other aspect of Catalyst's gameplay, the combat is a lot less sluggish than the original. You could do light and heavy attacks and are able to chain them out of movement like slides, wall runs or jumps to do excess damage. Once again, to start off with, I wasn't very impressed. But then, once again, on a second playthrough, I enjoyed it much more. And I thought, why? I, I genuinely was so confused. It's because I realised the limitations of the system and worked around it. There is no counter or block button in Catalyst, and the different class of enemies basically have one optimal combo that will kill them the quickest. There are five enemy types in Mirror's Edge Catalyst. That is Paul Blart Mall Cop, Riot Police, what I think is any character from Rainbow Six Siege, Alien Border Patrol, and Megatron Man. And I'll save you time right now. To beat them, you need to punch, 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 kick until dead, punch, kick until dead, kick until dead, kick, jump kick, run up wall and jump kick, really any sort of kick, until dead. That is the combat. John, what about special combat skills and super fantastic? No, don't worry about it. Just do that. It's the most efficient. It's the most fun. It's a good time. Don't worry about it. My first time around, I hadn't realised there was a best way to beat these guys, and I was, I was underwhelmed. But then... Eventually, I was inspired. Inspired after many upgrades and hours of gameplay, when I, as Faith, jumped into the air and kicked a man so hard in the chest, his clothes exploded. This is when I realised, this should be a kung fu game. I'm serious, the movement in Mirror's Edge Catalyst is all but nailed. All of the gunplay stuff, that was awkward, but kicking people into and off of walls, circling around them to take them down quickly, or just light attacking through a group at full speed to keep up your momentum is legitimately great fun. No fumbling around with guns or punching someone in the back of the head for 15 seconds straight. When things are over and done with quickly, that's when it feels the best. Yeah. This is actually a really good opportunity. <laughs> With the state of the franchise right now, this is just an idea that I hope an indie dev takes onto their own project, but for now I can proudly proclaim that exploding a man's clothes is the most fun I've had in Mirror's Edge Catalyst, and also that one time at a stranger's house I'd rather not talk about right now. Forgive me for a second, I'm going to go on a bit of a tangent here, but do you remember when Doom Eternal came out? And there was this weird feeling going around where the game was, technically speaking, one of the best shooters ever made, but also had such a weirdly over-convoluted plot and kind of strangely garish colour palette, which you can fix like very easily in the sentence by the way, it, it takes like two minutes, that it somehow didn't really feel right. It was like hanging out with your best friend after a five year break, but now he wears at least half a dozen wristbands on each arm and keeps unironically talking about the sesh. And at that time, I remember someone was talking about how they didn't like the story and they thought it was convoluted and bad. And someone responded in a rude, dismissive way, because it's the internet and anonymity makes people arseholes, stating, <laughs> lol, that's your fault for caring about Doom's story. Now, while obviously that guy was being a bit of a dickhead, and I've since asked my dad to get off of Reddit, it does bring up an interesting point. That a game like Doom can have a good or bad story, even though that's not the reason one plays a Doom game. Doom 2016 has an excellent opening, 
with an easy to follow plot about stopping a scientist from unleashing literal hell on earth so he can use hell energy to get 400 miles to the gallon. Oh, also Cyborg Tilda Swinton is in it as well. Oh, she's got a bicycle pump, look out. It's nothing amazing, but it's easy enough to follow and gives us reasons to visit the cool places and kill all the demons in front of us. Meanwhile, Doom Eternal starts with you in a floating castle orbiting Earth, a situation that I don't think is truly ever explained, and is doubly confusing since Doom 2016 ends with the Doom Slayer imprisoned. So as soon as you start the game, you're already confused. The first thing you do in the first mission is kill something called a Hell Priest, which is a term you hear for the first time but seems to be exceptionally important to whatever is going on. Then throughout the game you end up visiting different worlds and cultures, all with very fancy sounding J.R.R. Tolkien-esque names. On top of that, the game is filled to the brim with lore snippets, endless pages is about the origins of XYZ and ancient cultures and blah blah, who gives a shit? It's a Doom game and you feel like you've just opened up a Warhammer codex in Chinese. If you can't speak Chinese, if you can't speak Chinese, then I guess you'll just be bored at your fucking mind. And I was reminded of all that when I got a couple hours into Mirror's Edge Catalyst, because while the story isn't particularly good, the ending is, in fact, really quite laughably bad. The important thing is, the story does not get in your way. The only thing the story in a Mirror's Edge game needs to do is give me a reason to run and jump all over people's furniture. And the locations you'll end up running and jumping throughout the story are surprisingly awe-inspiring. You've got massive construction sites, underground bases, Tron-tastic networking layers, and my favourite, Dyson headquarters. They stand out from the rest of the game world as some impressive parkour playgrounds, and that's all they need to be. A quick lowdown so you know what you're getting into. Like the original Mirror's Edge, we play as the runner Faith, a modern-day hush-hush secret hardcore parkour delivery gal that may or may not be used for illegal purposes, but as far as the plot is concerned, mainly altruistic activities to stop a tyrannical government. Faith has just been released from prison for a reason you'll only ever find out about if you read it online, but I didn't care enough, so I'm just going to assume she pirated the Rush Hour trilogy, because who doesn't love a little bit of Rush Hour? The first character you'll meet is Icarus, he looks like a can of Red Bull who's become human for a day and has been your stand-in replacement in the runner crew you're a part of while you've been doing time. As you can tell from the way he dresses, he's a sarcastic little bitch-ass punk and has definitely invested in at least two different forms of cryptocurrency. Probably Dogecoin because fucking lol imagine paying back your student loan with doggos and <laughs> you want to see something random. <laughs> His attitude is strangely antagonistic towards Faith. Like, you'd think he'd just be excited to meet one of the best runners around, especially since Faith is an OG in the crew he's in, and Icarus is the new kid on the block. Then you meet up with your boss Noah, which as we find out through flashbacks later on, is also the guy who's been looking after Faith since her parents died. Spoilers, yes, Faith's parents are dead, but of course they are. What type of mum and dad would let their daughter walk around with this haircut? After reuniting with her adopted cardio daddy, we get introduced to some mechanics and the City of Glass, which is, as far as we're concerned, controlled by one of your run-of-the-mill corporation evil men, Gabriel Kruger. Gabriel Kruger is... He's basically any rich white guy. Point like, honestly, take your pick. Elon, Bezos, fucking Ronald, could be any of them. After performing a run through one of Kruger's office buildings, Faith deviates from her orders to capture a mysterious hard drive that has something called reflection on it. We meet many other characters along the way, none of them are remarkable really, so I have no idea how I still remember most of them. There's the hacker Plastic. I just wanted to mention Plastic because I feel like the direction the actress was given in the booth was to be as autistic as possible, and my god, she really doesn't pull any punches in that regard. Mind or will? That's not a binary question. Then there's Rebecca Thane, the leader of a resistance group called Black November, which I found a little bit odd, because I don't know about you, but that name gave me kind of Malcolm X and the Black Panthers vibes, but Black November has nothing to do with black people. Like, the members are of whatever colour, it would seem, and even worse, it's got nothing to do with November. And here I thought we were finally going to give some well-deserved attention to National Impotency Month. I mean, in general, November is quite an intense month, you know, we've got a... Uh, got National Impotency Month, National Diabetes Month, National Alzheimer's Month, but uh, it does all come back to a little bit of fun with <laughs> National Fun with Fondue Month. Quite interestingly though, Black November is a terrorist group of all things. Only opposition to the corporate overlords you're up against are legit bad people. 
they actually kill civilians and blow up shopping centres. They're absolute nut jobs. Like during the story, someone mentions that Rebecca executes a member of the group for resetting the fucking Wi-Fi password or something. It's just bonkers. And I love how at odds both Rebecca's looks are and her performance is with her being a terrorist. At no point does she seem remotely intimidating and every time she would give me shit over the radio, I'd just be like, Rebecca, how about you fucking shut up with your stupid Assassin's Creed Facebook Marketplace trench coat and your VO5 extreme style haircut, okay? You do not look like a leader. You look like California's barista of the year 2015. And I'm not sure your opinion matters. Big Gabriel Kruger himself is a... Uh, well, he's the bad guy. Well, he's fine. He, do, he does have some lines I quite like, though. At one point, he, he describes Faith as having a myopic view of the world. Myopic's quite a, quite a good word. I like that one. Uh, and then there's Isabel Kruger, his daughter, and as soon... This is a spoiler, by the way, but it's, it's so obvious. I'll be shocked if you didn't figure it out yourself. As soon as I saw her, I thought, Oh, she's a... Uh, She's got very beautiful, delicate Japanese features, just like Faith. I wonder if that's... Well, I wonder if that's Faith's sister. Of course it's her sister. She's the only other Asian woman in the game. There's another Asian guy, but fucking he don't look like my sister. Her name is Kat, and I will now explain the lacklustre ending so you can see just how little of that comes to fruition. Right, the ending the Mirror's Edge Catalyst. So you, f you find out what's on the hard drive. And it's like, G Gabe has a bunch of like dodgy pics of kids. And you're like, aha, Gabe, I'm going to put on the internet and everybody's going to know you're a beast. And he's like, what? Fuck you. And so you upload it. And then he comes in with like two basic fucking enemies. Looking like Lord Farquaad, by the way. And he's like, I'm going to stop you. And you're like, whatever. So then you fight the normal guys. And if you're like me, you try to do Jackie Chan moves for five minutes until you finally beat them. And then there's a cutscene. And you don't fight Gabe because he's such a fucking simp that in the cutscene, he gets out of baton, and Faith literally just runs into him, and he's like, ah, my ass, and that's him done. Uh, then he's like, oh, I'm just going to walk about, I hope that's cool use. And then he's like, oh, well, on the hard drive, uh, you, you, oh, by the way, your sister, she has, like, AIDS or whatever, but on the hard drive, the cure for AIDS. And then Kat walks in, and she's like, ah, my AIDS! And you're like, oh, fuck. And then Kat runs away, and she runs to the roof, right? You know, like, oh, where could she possibly go to the roof? Because she's impulsive. She's like, oh, she doesn't know what to do. She's she's between her sister and her adopted father, whatever. And you think she runs up the roof. No, what she does is she runs up the roof. Then she zip lines down like the skyscraper, falls on like a ramp, falls on a blimp, and then falls her death, if you're like me. Then you do it again, and you, it's like a ramp, blimp, and then a big pad. So she does all that. This is impulse. She just ran away from home, basically. And then you, you walk out there and then Kat's there and you're on this platform and you have this kind of cu cool kung fu movie moment, except it's kind of cringeworthy because they put like this Kingdom Hearts music over it. Stop it, Kat! My name is Isabel! Um, and there's this really funny bit where like Faith is trying to talk sense into her. She's like, your name is Caitlin Connors! And she just gets like fucking thwacked right in the throat. Your name is Caitlin Connors! <laughs> and then there's more punching and kicking which looks really cool. You don't get a fighter, by the way. And then they do more Kung Fu, and then Kat, like, punches the wall behind her because she just can't take the pain. Um, and then the whole thing starts falling down. I don't know why the place is falling apart because it's an Indiana Jones movie. So everyone's falling down, and then Gabe shows up again. I don't know. I take some pictures and then whack off to it later. Uh, and everyone starts falling down, and then Kat saves Faith. And then Gabe's like, oh, I've fallen off my horse. And Kat's like, oh, i got to fucking save him. Faith's like, no, I don't do it. And she disappears. Whole thing collapses and you're like, oh, well, they're fucking dead. But then Kat shows up in a helicopter and you're like, oh, well, she's alive. Oh, Gabe must be dead. But then I think in the credits, they're like, oh, no, he's, he's, he's still alive or whatever. And then post-credits, it's really funny because Faith is basically saying how shite the ending is. Because she literally says, like, nothing changed, nothing mattered, except, except we started something. Something we intend to finish. And you're like, what, well, a sequel? <laughs> no. And that's, uh, that's how the game ended. Let's get, uh, let's get my cat so that feels like that was worthwhile. Here you go. What are you doing? You wanna hang out? What do you think of the end of the mirror's edge? You think it's reductive? Yeah, no, I thought it was kind of, it's kind of lazy as well. So you can add Mirror's Edge Catalyst to the list of depressing yet amusing video games that have confident mid-season finales as sequel bait endings only to be irrevocably shut down of any possibility of a conclusion because the series got cancelled. 
which is a shame, for as perfectly okay as much of the story is, I at least enjoyed how much the writers were really doing the bare minimum to maintain my interest. I can only assume that Catalyst was rushed, as many other minor plots alluded to in side missions, like this high caste person who seems to share a history with Faith, and this other runner to which you have a friendly back and forth with, are left completely unresolved. The fate of Black November and Dogen, who is a pretty well acted crime lord, to which Faith spends most of the story trying to pay back, as there is some never explained history between them, they don't have a conclusion either. All of this was quite a shock as I was looking to bury my teeth into some exploratory side missions, only to find out that I had already, in fact, beaten every side mission. So I'm sorry to say, no, you ain't never gonna find out where Faith got her shoes, or tattoo, or hairstyle. Sadly, I have to say, whatever Pinterest post inspired her look is truly lost to time. Forever. I'll be real with you, when it comes to presentation, there isn't much to say. Catalyst looks very pretty, runs very well, has some booktastic tunes, and several rather spectacular story missions that I mentioned before. The only major distraction is how little the city of glass feels like an actual city. Apart from one tiny area of the map, you're always on the rooftops or underground or in construction sites, and so there is no real sense of what the average human's life is like in this admittedly quite interesting, if somewhat underdeveloped, world. Understandably, the rooftops aren't filled with grannies coming back from the shops, which is no big deal, but the areas that should contain NPCs are quieter than Woolworth's headquarters right now. Like this rooftop gastro pub, with no tables, chairs, staff, or customers. I'm no Gordon Ramsay, but even I know it's going to take more than a smaller menu and new tablecloths to get this place going. How disgusting. The dockside penthouses of the latter half of the game also have barely any people in them. Maybe even stranger than all of that is that all of the bankers and CEOs you'd expect to run by as they're doing coke or throwing bricks at poor people have just left every door and window open for you to fly through like they just had the exterminator in. All of this makes the game feel like you're running through an admittedly quite fun art installation or what I imagine City 17 might be like if Steve Jobs and Mark Zuckerberg coalesced into a Bloodbornean-esque eldritch super being with the one objective of becoming the world's most soulless civil engineer. It's a bit bland. In conclusion, even though I did not connect with Mirror's Edge Catalyst on an emotional level, it still do make my pee pee hard. And now that EA has crammed its body under the now bulging floorboards of where they keep all the other interesting IPs that the kids think went to the farm, I am eagerly awaiting for another developer to rip off this game and call it something equally as obtuse as Mirror's Edge, like Chandelier Boundary. Mirror's Edge Catalyst is the classic essence of video games. It has plot and characters, but they are the plain white concrete under your feet, because you are just there to run, jump, and have a good time. And importantly, none of the story is bad enough to be distracting. What does fall flat is more of an entertaining little light law, what were they even trying to do there, than anything that will stop you from having a good time. And when everyone in your game looks like a 22nd century Topshop model, it's hard to care too much about those things. So next time I want to know what it feels like to be an Asian woman in a world run by rich white men, I'll ask my girlfriend how her day was. Mirror's Edge Catalyst gets four sexy idiots and a vaguely German bad guy out of ten. And that is Mirror's Edge Catalyst. I hope you've enjoyed today's review. I am back and I'm a bald boy. I know it's a, it's a divisive look, but I was getting sick of it. And, uh, you know, a skinhead look to be sure. But, uh, you know, my coefficient of drag has never been better. If you've enjoyed my sense of humour, you may very well enjoy my streams. If you can't be bothered with streams, you can always enjoy the gameplay highlights on my second channel for other sketches and comedy related stuff. I have my comedy channel, Jordan Westenberg, and um, in the words of a new weird YouTube channel I found, may your games make you happy and smart, and may people respect you for playing them. <laughs> Didn't make that up, here it is. May your games make you happy and smart, and may people respect you for playing them. I love that shit. Anyway, thanks for watching, and I'll see you next time.